Maryland, WROI, WROIFM.com. Audio live, RTC Channel 5. Audio soon to be video on RTC Channel 4. That's why Elizabeth is here. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for coming back. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. So with that said, we're going to talk with John Alley. President, CEO, Woodlawn Hospital. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to have you with us. Hey, nice spring day. A little bit of rain out there today. It's just and, uh, a touch. Yes. <laughs> It'll fill the pond. <laughs> it fills the pond. Yes, it does. <laughs> exactly. The Board of Trustees were meeting yesterday, correct? Yes. Our monthly meeting was yesterday. And, uh, you know, again, we're kind of that slow time every year. Not a lot going on. Uh, but we did uh, cover some very important things. And I think the first and foremost thing that the board wanted to update on where we're at and what we're going to do is there's been a lot of activity locally with the school bus cameras uh, the stop arm cameras and you know we've been a very firm supporter of that with the rochester schools and you know continue to support that and want people if you haven't made a contribution please do so but we have other schools in our community too we've got tippy sure. valley and cast and so we've uh, had one of the board chairs mr mulligan uh, was kind of reaching out, and we're come find out they are going to be looking to the the same program with those school bus stop arms. So our commitment to them is the same we did to Rochester. So uh, we're trying to make contact with a couple of the the superintendents today. I understand with school being out, we might have to delay it for a day or so, but we want to support them also the same amount. So we did support Rochester with ten thousand dollars. We're going to do Tippy Valley and Caston with an equal amount because you know they're part of our community. Their kids are our kids. Uh, and as I said on you know one of the interviews that I did, that they are the future. Uh, you know that's who we're going to look to as we move forward. That's a critical element too, and of course the uh, school bus thing, which was uh, brought to light in October in that tragic accident. And it's nice to see Woodlawn stepping up to to kind of fill the void on some of that. Again, you know it's it's part of our mission. When you look at what our job is, it's just not to take care of the sick is to provide for the you know, safety and well-being of our community. These kids are our community. They're, they're all part of us. You know, we have our, our employees. Their kids go to those schools. So it's just the right thing to do for us to say, we're committed to this. It's important to us. But it also, we need the support of the other members of the community. I mean, outstanding support for Rochester. Now we need to show that same love, same support as we look to Tippy Valley and Caston. You know, they've got the same issues. You know, the school budgets are tight. They really don't have the money to do these type of programs, so they need to look to us and the community to support them. So, you know, please keep supporting Rochester, but as Caston and Tippy Valley's moving forward with this project too, you need to think of them also, and we need to help them too. John, as an aside, you came from hospital administration. You came from the uh, the uh, police sector of the uh, of the economy, and you probably saw some of this uh, disregard of school buses while you were a police officer. Absolutely, you know it's it's hard to comprehend when you sit and and think of the process. You know, you got the school bus where they're picking up or dropping off kids. What is so important in your life that you can't stop for two to three minutes to allow those kids to get on that bus safely? So, you know, we've come disconnected in our society as we drive. I think, you know, the distracted driving is worse now than it was several years ago when, you know, when I was a deputy with the Sheriff's Department. But you saw, we saw it then. It's nothing new. It's not something that's just happening today. And unfortunately, it took the tragedy that we had in our county to bring this to the forefront. And, and now people are saying this is an issue and what we need to do with it. I know the state legislature are looking at this and, and how can they put teeth in a law that says if you violate this if you run that stop arm here's what's going to happen and i think you know the they really need to look at that long and hard and uh, you know make it a fairly substantial penalty you know my i wouldn't mind seeing that same as drunk driving same as reckless driving because by that action you're putting young lives at risk and you need to be held accountable we just got to pay attention when you see that school bus even if it's not got its star, stop arm out, slow down, pay attention to what's going on, because there's going to be kids around it. If there's a school bus, there's kids. We need to be aware of that. And particularly, Leary, I guess, if it's dark outside. Oh, absolutely. You know, as we're looking at our winter months, you know, when school's in session, you know, the kids are getting on the bus in the dark. They're getting off the bus sometimes in the dark. Be aware of that. Know your surroundings. Pay attention when you drive. Put the cell phone down. You really don't need it while you're driving. You don't need to talk. You don't need to be texting. Put it down. Pay attention to your surroundings. All right, John. Other notes from the trustees meeting? Yeah, the other one we're, we're working on is going to be a, a fairly long process. So uh, in July of last year, we was able to get Fulton County designated. It was called a health professional shortage area 
or in acronyms in healthcare, it's a HIPSA, and which that means is that based on our population and number of physicians, we could use some more physicians in the area. So in an effort to entice that, uh, you know, physicians to come here, two things from that. One is there's some federal programs for physician student loans that they can be forgiven at the federal level if they take a job in this type of area. But more importantly, to help us recruit that, there is an additional compensation or reimbursement we can get from Medicare and Medicaid. So what we have to do, we make an application to, to the government takes anywhere from 12 to 18 months because they want to just make sure we're going to do what we say we're going to do. So we have to have inspectors come in. They look at our buildings. But what it will do is basically increase our, our reimbursement. So, and I'll, we don't know those exact numbers yet because it's going to be based on our, our cost and our population. But let's assume right now we're getting $50 from Medicare for a patient visit. That might go up to 60 to $75. Now, it doesn't sound like that yeah, but much. but it's a big deal. It's a big deal when you look at our Medicare population and our Medicaid population. You know, that's probably 60% of our business. That's large dollars for us that now we can take that additional reimbursement. One, pay for new physicians to come in the community to get our, you know, our level up where it needs to be, and infrastructure so we can buy the, the testing equipment, do the renovations to meet the needs of, the, of our patients. So really excited that we was able to get that designation for Fulton County. Now we need to use that, leverage that, as we move forward with the rural health clinics. And uh, you know, it's, a, it's a complicated process. You know, A couple board members says, well, can we get this done in a couple of weeks? And, and no, we're dealing with the government. So it's going to take several, <laughs> several months to get this done. And uh, But it's going to be worthwhile. And you know, when you look at the light at the end of the tunnel, what's that going to mean to, to the hospital and to the community? It's a very big deal. Allow us to recruit physicians, do infrastructure, buy new equipment, new testing equipment to meet our needs. So, Are we short on doctors, John? We're short on doctors, okay. yeah. We've got... Uh, you know, we've got an, uh, an opening now it's in, in Argus. We're looking for a physician there. But I've got to look four, five, six, seven years out because that's sometimes how long it takes to recruit a physician. And so some of our other docs here are saying, you know, I'm, I'm starting to think about that retirement. Right. So, you know, I've got a plan now for five, six, seven years out. So, you know, when this physician says, hey, I'm going to retire in a couple of years, I've got somebody hopefully in the pipeline. And what we're going to now is actually medical students still in school and trying to entice them to, you know, come commit to Woodlawn Hospital. It's kind of like a, co- a college athlete or a high school athlete to commit to a college. Doing the same thing, you know, if they're willing to come and say, I- I'm going to work at Woodlawn for five years, then we help them a little bit with their student loans. Now with the HIPSA designation, federal government can help them with this too. So it's a little more of an enticement for those physicians to look to a rural community opposed to the metropolitan areas because it's hard for me to, to compete with Indianapolis, Fort Wayne, South Bend. They have so much more to offer from a, you know, not just in the facility, but, you know, the, the entertainment factor, you know, the after hours. The, the physicians are looking for that. They want that decompression time. So right now, I, I'm selling us. say, well, we're close to Indianapolis. We're close to Fort Wayne. We're close to Chicago. But sometimes, you know, they like that 20-minute drive. They can go to, you know, to theater. They can go to the op, whatever they want to go to. That's what we're competing against. So we're hoping... Uh, this designation opens some eyes to some of these medical students now that maybe it's not going to get out of school for three or four more years. We're talking to them now to try to get that commitment. So when they do graduate, they get their MD or their DO, we've got a spot for them. And they can just slip right into our organization. John, you mentioned five years. Is that like a mandatory thing that uh, if they go with the IPSA thing, they have to stay at Woodlawn for five years? No, that's, that's okay. you know, most of the time right now, kind of the standard contracts with physicians when they agree to come on board with an organization and we as an organization say, okay, we'll pay your student loans for you. What we want is, is a commitment from them. So if I'm going to pay your student loans, I want you to stay three or four years. So that varies. Uh, you know, if the student loans are not exorbitant, Usually it's a three-year commitment. If they have a lot of student loans, then we say, we want five years because we've got a lot of money we've invested. And uh, you know, student loans are, for a physician are expensive. I mean, they have a lot of dollars invested in that. And unfortunately, because of that career path, they don't have the opportunity to make a lot of money while they're getting that MD or that DO. So, you know, they, they have to have student loans to help them get through that school. So they come out with a tremendous amount of debt. We'll help them with that, but in turn, we want to, you know, you to say, hey, for your effort for us paying those loans, we'll stick around three, four, five years. And if we can get them to stay three, four, five years, usually they're long term at that point. They're committed to the organization. And that's fair. And it's fair. You know, yes. it really is. John Alley's with us, President and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital, bringing us up to date on the Board of Trustees meeting yesterday, John. Yeah, the final thing we got into was the December financials. Um, 
And again, we were hoping for a, a, a black bottom line for December, but we missed it by that much. Uh, <laughs> we had gross patient revenue about twelve point three million. Uh, we wrote off seven point six million. Again, we're still in that sixty sixty two percent range. We had uh, that left us with an operating revenue of four point seven, and we had operating expenses of five point one. So we did show a loss of about three hundred eighty three thousand. So you know, one of my jobs is I go back to my finance guy and say, okay. Why did this happen? What you know? What was in there? One of the things that we do each year, and we can't do it till December, is with Medicare they give us an estimated payment during the year based on our previous year's cost. What we determined is for 2018, our cost to provide services actually went down. So they based our 18 payment on our 17 numbers. So they've actually overpaid us, and we're thinking it's around six to seven hundred thousand so we have to have a payable go back to them so we've booked that number we won't know what that number actually is and probably till april because much like everybody else we've got a it's called a cost report but it's a basically a tax return and uh, we have to go through and allocate all of our expenses and how much of it was medicare and not is a, a very complicated process but we can kind of guess on our end we've got some tools that we look at so we think we're probably going to owe them a little bit of money back so we went ahead and made that provision in there. Um, and then also we, we kind of went over budget on our payroll. We did do Christmas bonuses, a holiday bonus for all of our employees. So, again, that kind of added to that $300,000 loss. So we know what it is. I, you know, I'm not upset. It was those when you can't identify that, that concerns me. We know exactly what prompted this loss. We're just being conservative as we're looking to that Medicare payable uh, come April. For the year 2018? For the year 2018, uh, we, we've got a positive bottom line, uh, not as well as we'd like to have. But, you know, if, if, I, if you're ever comfortable with your bottom line, then you're not doing your job. So as we're looking for 19, there's things that we're going to put in place that we hope is going to bolster that again. Because without that positive bottom line, I can't invest back into the organization. I can't invest back into our, our resources, which is, you know, our people and, you know, for retention. So a lot of things we're trying to work in, in 19 to change what we did in 18 to make us, again, a little more efficient. My fear is at some point, because of a, a, a critical access hospital, that means Medicare pays me my cost plus 1%. At some point in time, if that program goes away, then I go back to what's called a PPS hospital, where I get a flat rate. So if you come in for pneumonia, government pays me $3,000. If it costs me 5000 to provide that care or 200 they don't care. I get a flat rate. With us being in a kind of a cost control mode, I'm ready for that. So, you know, we've got our costs down. It, it pretty well, we're as lean as we can get, really controlling the cost good. If we do lose that critical access through legislative process and we're converted back to PPS, it's just going to be, okay, another day for us. We're ready for it. You know, there's some other hospitals that live off of that cost, and they drive their cost up as high as they can to maximize that Medicare reimbursement. I'm just not comfortable with that that scares me that at some point if that would go away then that would really jeopardize the hospital and that's the last thing we want to do i think we're well prepared if we would lose critical access status to convert back to pps would it be tough yes would we survive absolutely you talk about legislation would that come from the state of indiana no it would be federal that would be so, federal so that would be you know i i watch very carefully when they talk talk about their budget uh, changes because last time health care is the easy target you know they look to health care to say okay we're going to cut this and cut that and we've seen in the past uh, from our reimbursement because of being cost based we used to get cost plus two percent now we get cost plus one percent and there's been a movement lately to say we're just going to give you cost so it's tough to operate when you know the best you can get reimbursed is what you paid for you know it gives you no profit margin and uh, you know I, I can get on my soapbox about you know the history of healthcare, <laughs> but you know a lot of folks pay for people who don't pay so that's why our, our costs our charges are so high when if i could and i think i've said it before if i could get everybody to pay me exactly what we bill them we could probably cut every charge in the hospital in half and that would allow us a, a three to four percent margin every year and when you think of that, that that's astronomical, the amount of, and when we look at our write-offs, writing off 62% of what we bill, a lot of that is outside our control. That That is insurance companies saying, don't care what you bill me, here's what I'm going to pay you. Government payers are unfortunately the folks that just don't pay. You know, somebody has to pay for our services. So we spread those costs basically through those inflated charges to everybody and realizing we're only going to collect about 62% or about 40%, 48% of it. 
And basically, if I if I understand, was the bottom uh, line of the Affordable Care Act that uh, those who could afford it were paying for those who couldn't afford Correct. it. Correct. And, you know, that's not worked out real well. We're, uh, just this year, we've seen a lot of folks have notified us that had insurance last year that no longer have anymore. The, their program has been discontinued because, again, insurance companies, they're all, they work bottom lines also. And if they don't make their margins, they just discontinue the product. And so we've seen a, a several folks. We work very closely with the Compassionate Health Center here in town. And I you know, had a report from them the other day that just in the past two weeks, they've had like 15 new enrollees that have come in and says, I don't have insurance anymore. Either my employer has discontinued it or that you know my a uh, Affordable Care Act insurance is no longer available. So now they're seeing, so they're trying to ramp up because they're having more and more folks come in. So that's some of the you know the dynamics of healthcare that we got to look in my crystal ball and I got to figure out what's going to happen you know next month, next year, and uh, prepare today for what we think that future is going to be. We'd all like to have one of those. Yeah, I, I'll rent mine out <laughs> if you would really like to use it. It's, yes, it, I would. Thank it's you not very a pretty much. picture looking in it sometimes. <laughs> Does that pretty well conclude the board meeting? That was pretty well the board meeting. Because well, I wanted to ask you about something we've talked about several times before, and that was as you looked ahead to 2019, the possibility of some room renovation at Woodlawn Hospital. Still looking into that. Uh, what we're doing right now is trying to just get the dust to settle with some of the changes. So we had a very good plan in place based upon what we thought from the Affordable Care Act and who's going to be insured. Now we're seeing some major changes in that. I think it's probably going to delay that project six or seven months. We're revamping. Uh, we're still, you know, I call it my rainy day fund or, you know, my, my coffee can fund. We're still putting money aside. So when that project does kick off, I want to pay for it. I don't want to have to borrow money for that project because, you know, as you add debt to an organization, you know, that's not good because it has to be repaid at some point. So let's have that all that money in place before we go into it. So it, it's not dead. It's it's still percolating out there. And then we're also looking, there's been some changes now made from regulatory agencies on what our building must look like. So once I start a renovation, then I fall under a whole new guidelines of uh, you know fire protection and stuff like that. And those haven't really been settled yet. So we're anticipating right now to have some final ruling on some of those mid-year. Uh, right now, we're grandfathered in, so we, we don't have to do anything. They said, well, if your building was originally like this, you can leave it. But once I start making renovations, then I have to fall under all these new building codes that we just don't, we can't qualify for now. So that would change my whole construction process. So I want to make sure we know what those are, because I don't want to be half through, halfway through the project. Somebody come and say, oh, by the way, you know, you can't do that. So we're wanting to make sure that's done also. So a lot of uh, behind the scenes affect what we want to do from that renovation. Talking with uh, County Commissioner Brian Lewis earlier this morning, and he mentioned the same type of thing concerning the courthouse steps. They're going to renovate the courthouse steps, but in doing that, in some of the steps, there is no base underneath it. Well, they're going to have to go with what code is today, and that's Correct. exactly what you're saying yeah, in, in, the, in the hospital situation. And it's tough to take an older facility, and, you know, the, the hospital's not new. It's, it's well-kept. Courthouse, same thing. It's, you know, it's outstandingly well-kept, but once you start... Mm -hmm fixing things all of a sudden now it has to meet new codes and it wasn't designed from that 30 years ago so it, it's a major expense to you know get that infrastructure to that design of the new requirements before you can do your renovation so it's it's kind of like you you pick the rock up and you look and go uh-oh but you can't put the rock back down <laughs> once right. you've started it john alley president ceo woodlawn hospital agenda items for february at that point, I, I hope we have the uh, the new 3D mammogram in. Uh, they've started construction on the room, uh, renovating the room where it's going to go into, which, again, interesting, that's in the newer part of our building, but there's different codes now. So once we you know kind of break the seal on that, we have to meet all those new code requirements. So there's some electrical requirements, square footage requirements, so that's all being in there. But I think we're ready. Um, final preparation now with the uh, the vendor from the electrical requirements for that room. We've got to up that a little bit. Uh, still working with some of our insurance carriers. Unfortunately, a few of them do not recognize 3D. Uh, and they say, well, we're not going to pay for that. We're moving forward. The 3D is what's... It's coming. It's coming. It's the right thing to do. It's what the patients need because of the te that technology can detect far sooner than what we currently have now if there is a, a, a small nodule in, in the breast. It's going to find it. So, you know, my, my comment was kind of damn the torpedoes full speed ahead. It's the right thing to do for our patients. We're going to move forward and work 
work through that compensation or the reimbursement later. We'll, we'll figure that out. This is the right thing to do to get this technology in our building for our patients as we move forward. So it's exciting. It's exciting. The medical it, staff has to be excited oh, about that. Yes, everybody is. Even our, our radiology staff, I mean, they're, they're kind of chomping at the bit. Can we get it in? Can we get it in? We're you know, at the mercy of the vendor because we got to get in their schedule too. But they're ready for it, uh, you know, the training to get that in there. It's exciting technology. It's from a layman like me, it's it's amazing what they can do. I just kind of sit back and say, okay. Uh, they start using Turn your, it on. Yeah, they use like those 14, 15 letter words and everything. I'm going, okay, just doesn't work. So, yeah, anxious to get that in. Uh, you know, we've got some, you know, we got to do some test patients. So, we got some staff members says, you know, I want to be first. I want to be first. So, that tells me a lot when you get staff saying, I want to be the first one. You know, do me, do me. So, working for that and, uh, Hopefully, as we get to the end of January, 1st of February, we're going to start doing a little more media uh, advertising okay. on that. Uh, we're going to work with the manufacturer. they got some very nice programs uh, that they'll co-op with us and say, sure. we'll help with this sure. because, you know, they have a vested interest, too, that this product works. So, very Bring excited. Bring radio show next month. Absolutely. We'll, we'll see what we can do. Right. And uh, I'm excited for this project. I think it's going to be one of the bigger things that we've done for the community. You know, when we put the, the 64 slice CT scanner in, you know, that, that was a major milestone for I remember us. remember that. I think this is going to be that second major milestone that we're bringing to the community from a diagnostic capability uh, just light years ahead of where we're at now. John Alley, President and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital. Thanks for keeping us healthy, John. My pleasure. It's not, it's me, it's the staff. Okay. Uh, you know, like I said, they make me look good. Uh, surround myself with outstanding people. They make my job very easy. Good people make a big difference. Though. They absolutely do. John, thanks so much. Thank you.